tonight's keynote speaker. You can't hear me? Really? It's a pleasure <laughs> for me to be able to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Bob Kingston, who I've known and admired for many years. Uh, Bob uh, did a PhD uh, at Berkeley with uh, Mike Chamberlain, where he studied RNA polymerase I from E. coli and uh, its role in reporter genes. He then went on to do a postdoc with Phil Sharp at MIT. He tells me he was studying promoter bashing and effectively was studying CRMs, though at the time didn't, didn't realize that's what they were working on. Um, in 1982, Bob was actually awarded a, a Jane Coffin Child's Fellow. He was actually in the same program uh, the same year as uh, Mike Levine, our speaker from last night. So I figured today is a really a, a, this meeting is a great moment um, in the life of, of Jane Coffin uh, Fellows from 1982. He should show up in their newsletter or something. Um, he, he Bob came to uh, start at, uh, an assistant professorship at MGH in 1985 and has sort of risen through the ranks at, at MGH, which is my institution. Uh, and he became a full professor. He then became the chief of molecular biology, which is the basic sciences uh, department at Mass General Hospital. And uh, this year has now become the director of, of, uh, of research uh, for all of MGH. So this is uh, actually a great thing for, for our institution as well. So we're very pleased to have him there. Um, in 2011, Bob was, uh, was inaugurated into the American Academy of, of Arts and Sciences. Um, and before uh, I bring him up here to speak, I should just say from a chromatin perspective, the remarkable things that Bob has, uh, has, has discovered over his career. Um, in the 90s, uh, he was a pioneer in understanding uh, the mechanisms and functions of chromatin remodelers, nucleosome remodelers, very poorly understood at the time, doing outstanding biochemistry and gene regulatory work. Um, maybe even more well known is his uh, discovery of the PRC1 complex, the first characterization of the biochemical complex, the PRC1 complex, which is um, the very now well, um, very hotly uh, discussed and debated um, polycomb complex. Um, and, and since then, Bob has gone on to do a great deal more uh, exciting work around both polycomb repression and nucleosome activity, um, including his latest stuff on uh, the role of non-coding RNAs and, uh, and, and, and new insights from higher-ordered structural models of polycomb and repressor regulation that uh, I think he'll be sharing with us today. So thank you, Bob, for doing this speech. Thanks, Brad. And it's a real pleasure to be at this conference. I, I go to a lot of chromatin conferences and hear the same people say the same things over and over again, and it's a real pleasure to, um, they sometimes change a little bit, but um, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and listen to a whole bunch of new ways of thinking about things. And I hope uh, you will bear with me as I talk about chromatin for a while. Um, what I'm hoping to do is explain why polycomb is a system that is worthy of intensive study and is extremely complicated and why the sort of work that's done by the people in this room is almost certainly gonna be essential for figuring out how it works. So what's the basic problem that Polycomb's involved in? It's involved in maintaining the silencing of master regulatory genes. Uh, the, the classic problem of epigenetics is that you have a naive master regulatory gene in the fertilized egg, it either has to be heritably on in some cell lineages or heritably off in most cell lineages. And the job of polycomb is to keep things heritably off. So what it has to do is keep a gene off, and it's got to keep it off for the lifetime of the organism. So that's the epigenetic aspect of the equation. Um, this has been recognized for numerous years, uh, 65 years now since the initial identification of the polycomb gene. And there are a whole bunch of polycomb family genes, and they're all essential for maintaining the off state of genes during development. There are two primary functional polycomb group complexes. Uh, what my lab has been doing for the past 20 years is studying the biochemistry and identifying these complexes. PRC2 was discovered by a lot of uh, separate groups, contains three polycomb group proteins, 
uh, methylates histone H3 on lysine 27. That mark binds to the complex PRC1, which uh, our group um, has been working on for the last 13 or 14 years for polycomb group complexes. This is the engine of repression. So this is basically the components that maintain the repressed state. These are the mammalian names. Uh, many of you are probably very familiar with these proteins as they're involved in very many different processes. And uh, the complicated thing about thinking about how this whole system works is that the gene targets uh, for this system are huge. So here are the Hox loci, the most classic target for polycomb in mouse and human. They're over 100 kilobases in size, and you've got uh, a similar, uh, somewhat smaller, but very large Drosophila Hox cluster. And so what are the big questions in terms of thinking about polycomb as a critical system for maintaining repression of genes? Um, the first is targeting. How are polycomb group complexes that maintain silencing targeted to the appropriate places to provide maintenance of silencing? The second is the mode of repression. How precisely are the genes silenced? And in order, and the final is epigenetic memory. How is the silent state maintained during replication of mitosis? It's my opinion that to fully understand three, you really have to fully understand one and two because you have to understand how the whole thing gets targeted and you have to understand how it represses. And I'm gonna focus on one and two today. So in targeting, I'm gonna be talking about uh, technology development actually and technology development to try to understand how long non-coding RNAs are involved in polycomb targeting. We're not gonna get to polycomb in this part of the talk at all, but uh, this is a technology that I think is broadly useful and I hope will be interesting to the people in the audience. In the second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the mode of repression and talk about um, compacted nucleosomes, holding nucleosomes in place, and I'm gonna talk about how covalent modification regulates silencing in a system that isn't polycomb, but is highly related to polycomb. Okay, targeting. First part of the talk is about targeting and what is known about how you target polycomb to huge loci. It's mainly out of flies. In flies, polycomb response elements were identified, uh, Parada, Bender, many people. These polycomb response elements are located tens of kilobases away from the promoter that they repress. So these are DNA sequence elements that uh, are a kilobase roughly in size and that organize a rep large repressed domain, almost certainly a loop domain from more recent studies. And the question is, how does this form and what else is involved? It is unlikely that just a single DNA element is gonna provide the brains for uh, figuring out exactly how to organize 125 kilobases of appropriate repression. So targeting, what are the mechanisms that have been proposed? There are sequence-specific factors that bind to PREs, FO and its mammalian homolog YY1. There are covalent modifications of histones that are involved, H3K27 methylation. There are nucleosome free regions of PREs. And the most interesting area, uh, for, from my standpoint, is to sort out how long non-coding RNAs are involved in targeting polycomb and other things exist in hot air being two examples of target polycomb. So the first part of the talk is to talk about what I believe is important, gonna be important to figure out how we get at that problem and how to analyze the role for long non-coding RNAs. Why are we excited about long non-coding RNAs as being part of this process? Because it's, if you have a lot of long non-coding RNAs in a cell that are targeting repression, they are easily divided to do, distributed to daughter cells, and so it's a really nice mechanism for heritable repression, and it's a mechanism that works in heter, uh, heterochromatin heritable repression in fission yeast, and is involved in all sorts of other repressive uh, events in a lot of other organisms, including dosage compensation. Okay, so what might a long non-coding RNA do to help target polycomb? Um, the hypothesis is that they act in trans to regulate chromatin. In other words, the long non-coding RNAs are made somewhere in the genome and then go and are part of a complex that is involved in repression. And this is from John Rins 
work. John will speak later at the meeting. Um, but uh, you could, a uh, long non-coding RNA could be part of a complex that helps bring in a repressive mark. It could actually directly interact with the DNA to target to bring in a repressive mark, or it can be involved in both parts of the equation. But the key aspect is that the, the hypothesis is that there is a trans function for these RNAs. And it's known there's a trans function in various settings. So let's take exist in female, in, in mammals, in female, the X chromosome is inactivated. That's done by exist RNA. It coats the inactive X. And that coating has uh, been proposed by Jeannie Lee's group and other groups to be involved in targeting polycomb proteins to uh, various places on the X chromosome and therefore to help maintain repression of this large chromosome, which is also a job of the polycomb family. This family tends to be involved in clamping off really large regions. So if we want to understand how these long non-coding RNAs are involved in precise regulatory events, we have to, uh, we want to know where they act in the genome and what are their direct biochemical effects. And so what we really need is a technique like CHIP for RNA. So er, I'm sure most people in the room are familiar with CHIP, where with chromatin immunoprecipitation, you have a protein cross-link it to DNA and then pull it down with an antibody and find out what pieces of DNA it was bound to. Wouldn't it be nice to do something similar to that, to a non-coding RNA and find out exactly where it goes in the genome? And so I'll tell you how uh, we've developed a technology called CHART that uh, accomplishes that, and we believe accomplishes that very uh, efficiently and well. This is work of Matt Simon, uh, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, more recently joined by Jason West. Uh, Mitzi Kuroda's lab was involved in the proof of principle work, and a large amount of bioinformatics was done by Peter Park's group and Peter Karchenko, who was then in Peter's group, Mark Borowski, and Brad Chapman. So what do we want to do? We want to figure out where the direct targets of non-coding RNAs are. So we want to take a non-coding RNA, we want to cross-link it to DNA, we want to pull it down. So the obvious way to pull it down is to hybridize it to a capture oligonucleotide that's complementary to the RNA, pull it down, and get enough of the cross-link DNA to sequence and analyze. Um, and this is based on a lot of precedent from a lot of different laboratories. So what are the issues? The issue is you're making a capture oligo that's going to interact with your long non-coding RNA. It's going to bind your RNA of interest and pull it down. This is what you want to have happen. But what else can happen is your capture oligo can bind to the wrong RNA because it will hybridize inefficiently to other sequences. And um, even potentially worse, it can just hybridize directly to DNA and pull down DNA directly. So there are all sorts of potential artifacts uh, that can get in the way of this technology working. So what Matt has done is he's figured out how to get this to work, and he's done that by using the ROC system. Um, this is uh, dosage compensation in flies where the male X is turned up, and this is the ROC's RNA coding the male X. Um, and the ROCS RNA in flies binds to a protein called the MSL complex set of proteins. And so this serves as an elegant system to see whether this whole thing works because we know where the MSL proteins go from CHIP and we know that ROCS is bound to them. So we know that that's at least part of where the ROCS RNAs should go. So here's chromatin immunoprecipitation for MSL3, one of the key components of the MSL complex. And here is where MSL protein goes on the X chromosome. And the question then for validation of this technique is to see whether we can see rocks going to specific locations that overlap with this and also to find out whether rocks is more spread out than these peaks or whether it's identical to these peaks. And so again, what we did was cross, uh, find a probe to rocks, uh, cross-link the DNA, take a probe to rocks and pull down on it and figure out where the RNAs are, uh, where, what genome location they're bound to. So what we need to do is find accessible regions of the RNA for hybridization. I won't go into what we did. This is all published in PNAS and detailed protocols are available on our website. 
We can find conditions to pull down the RNA itself. I'll talk a just briefly about finding conditions where the bound DNA co-purifies with the RNA because this is the hardest step to get to go. Um, what Matt did to get that going was make sure he could actually pull down the genomic locus where the rocks RNA is transcribed. Obviously, it's going to be there. But also, a chromatin entry site mapped by Mitzi Kuroda's lab because the hi strong hypothesis is the rocks RNA should bind there. He used these as positive controls and a random region as a negative control. And what he finally, uh, after a lot of work, developed was the ability to show that he could bring down significant 2% of input DNA at both the rocks uh, where rocks is transcribed, but more importantly at this chromatin entry site uh, elsewhere. He could show that that enrichment is RNA mediated, and he could show that the enrichment that he's getting of the RNA at that site is similar to what you see with CHIP, 100 to 1,000 fold more signal where the rocks RNA is. Uh, than at a control place or that is found with a control sense oligonucleotide. So in other words, we can pull down RNA and pull down the captured DNA. So what happened when he did that, as I'm about to show you, is that he got a lot of peaks, but it was pretty clear from our initial bioinformatic analysis that many of those peaks were artifacts. And the artifact that was clear from the data I'm about to show you is that the capture oligo, instead of hitting the RNA and going to the genome, was pulling down directly on sequences that were close to homologous that were in the genome. In other words, hybridizing to the double-stranded DNA and pulling down these fragments. And here is uh, some of the data that showed us that this was a problem. This is an autosome. The ROX2 RNA is not supposed to go to an autosome. In the version one of chart that we developed, we still saw peaks on the autosome. And when you did the control, so this is using an, an antisense capture oligo that hybridizes to the RNA. The control is to take a sense oligo that won't hybridize to the RNA, but would obviously hybridize to the DNA in the, in the locus, uh, any locus with sequence homology. And you can see that the sense oligo is pulling down a lot of these same fragments. So in other words, this is pretty clearly from these data the capture oligo just directly pulling down on the genomic DNA. So a key part of the optimization was to get rid of that, and Matt accomplished that by uh, avoiding melting of the DNA and eluding, and this is the key step, eluding the RNA with, uh, and uh, the RNA crosslinks to DNA with um, RNase H, so the elution would only work if you had the capture oligo binding to the RNA of interest. And when he did that, here's the autosome that I just showed you. All of those spurious peaks went away. And when he looked at the X chromosome, and this is where we know ROX2 goes, he went from seeing peaks with a lot of noise to peaks that are vastly cleaner. And this, we believe, is a very clean and a very robust technology. Here is what happens when we ask the question I framed at the beginning. Here is the published data from Mitzi Kuroda's lab, Art Alexienko, on MSL3 tap chip. So here's protein chip. This is a screenshot showing part of the X chromosome and showing where MSL3 goes. These are the ROX2 chart data that Matt developed, and you can see the beautiful concordance. ROX2 is going exactly where MSL3 is throughout the genome. We can do this bioinformatically where we look at the ROX2 chart um, and, and plot that versus where MSL3 is, and you can see a nice uh, diagonal. Um, we can ask bioinformatically, we can look at the top ROX2 peaks where ROX2 is going and show that the more than 200, the more than 200 of the top peaks all overlap with sites of high MSL enrichment. We can show that the peaks align precisely between ROX2 and MSL, and perhaps most convincing is we can figure out what the sequence motif is that underlies the ROX2 binds. So here's what ROX2 chart pulls down, and this is using the standard things we heard about last night. Ga 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 ag is a sequence that ROX2 localizes to on the chromosome, and that is precisely the same sequence that MSL3 tap localizes to from analysis of the chip data. 
So we believe that there is a precise concordance of ROX2 and MSL3 on the genome from these data. So what we can conclude from this technology development, the biological conclusion is that ROX2 binds to the same chromatin entry sites that are bound by the MSL complex. And so the simplest hypothesis is that there is a protein complex that contains ROX2 as an integral part. If you eliminate ROX2, this whole thing uh, blows up and doesn't work. There's a MOF acetyltransferase that acetylates the histones, and this is how you maintain activity, ROX2 being a pivotal part of it, and this is, and it's just binding with these proteins. And uh, technically, uh, we have a protocol that allows high-resolution mapping of genomic targets of an RNA. Uh, we can target the endogenous RNA, and we can get a chip-like uh, enrichment and resolution. So that's in flies with a known large RNA. What happens when we, whoops. What happens when we try to go to mammals? Um, so um, we've gone to mammals, and uh, we're interested in things that interact with polycombs, so we started with MEAT1 and MALLET1, which is also called MEAT2. MALLET1 interacts with polycomb in work recently done from Jeff Rosenfeld's lab, and uh, these are two highly well-studied, highly uh, expressed, long non-coding RNAs that are relatively near each other in the genome, and so we started looking at both of these. And uh, as we'll, you will see becomes a theme in this talk, uh, we got the one that has nothing to do with polycomb to work, which is MEAT1. We haven't gotten MALLET1 to work yet, but we've been able to map MEAT1 in the genome. We can see it as an endogenous site, which isn't that exciting, but we can do chart seek and show that we can take oligos against MEAT1 and see it binding all over its own promoter but we can also see clear peaks in various regions of the genome that are not seen in the appropriate controls. And uh, we're just in the process of analyzing these data, but we're fairly convinced this is real data for where NEAT1 goes in the genome for a couple reasons. The first is if we look where NEAT1 is going in the genome, this is something involved in paraspeckles, by the way, and it's not clear why it, what it might be doing other than being involved in paraspeckles. Um, but where it is binding is highly enriched in genic sequences. So uh, this is uh, after Howard Chang's way of presenting this type of data, where these are, that's the human genome, and here is uh, the distribution in the human genome. And here we see introns, exons, and promoter regions that are brought down by NEAT1 charts, so we're highly enriched for genic regions. And what is particularly intriguing to us, and we don't understand at all yet, is that NEAT1 is physically located near transcription start sites, which depressingly enough as a transcription person are also labeled zero in my slide. Mike Levine and I are in the same place. This is minus one and that's plus one. There is no zero in transcription. Um, so this is where NEAT1 is going. Uh, this reminds me to say that Howard Chang has a technology called CHIRP, which does something similar. You'll be stunned to know that we believe our technology works better than Howard's technology. <laughs> um, and uh, this was published in Molecular Cell uh, this past fall. And this is Howard's CHIRP data on hot air and Turk. And you can see that what we're seeing with NEAT is distinguished from these two other non-coding RNAs in terms of localization. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of complexity here. So that finishes that part. And we now are at a stage where we can look at where non-coding RNAs go. We can use that to study polycomb by finding non-coding RNAs that might be involved in targeting polycomb, see where they go, knock them down, and see if we mess up polycomb regulation. But we think that this was a key step for us in terms of thinking about the methods for how this works. So what I want to do for the second half of the talk is switch from targeting to the mode of repression. And what I'm going to do now is switch from how the whole system is targeted to what it does after it's targeted. How are genes silenced? And I'm going to focus on compacted nucleosomes. Okay, so getting back to the original problem. You've got a gene, you've got to turn it off, you want it to be heritably off throughout the lifetime of an organism. How does it get turned off? You can't figure out how it's heritable until you figure out what, how it's turned off. And so how could it be turned off? What are the known and proposed mechanisms? You can compact at the macro from immunofluorescence, people like Wendy Bickmore, or micro, all the data I'm about to show you. 
level, you can compact nucleosomes, and I'll explain why that might block things like transcription initiation. This is completely consistent with what Mike Levine was telling us at the end of his talk last night. You can ubiquitinate histone H2A. That's something else that PRC1 does. Anna Pombo has proposed that to be involved and blocks the transcription elongation. There's no reason that these are mutually exclusive methods. This is a complicated process. It could easily use all of those. I'm going to focus on the role and crystal structure of compacted nucleosomes. Why do we care about compacted nucleosomes? Okay, so if you take a normal promoter, it's got nucleosomes that are sort of there, and they can be moved around and taken off and create these nucleosome-free regions and start sites, or they can be compacted and clamped down so that things can't move. And we believe that this is a central part of regulation. So uh, the rest of my lab worked on ATP-dependent remodeling, which we've worked on for over 20 years. You can take the beads on a string structure of a nucleosome, so that's nucleosome DNA, nucleosome DNA. This is atomic force microscopy we did with Charlie Lieber. You mix in ATP-dependent remodeling complexes in ATP. You shift the nucleosomes around. You get this open place in the genome that this is a promoter region. Now we can uh, transcribe from this region. So that's the opening up side of things. What happens with PRC1? This is work from Nicole Francis when she was a fellow in our laboratory. You can take um, be the beads on a string structure. This is Fritz, Fritz Woodstock uh, EM pictures and mix in PRC1 components and get these compacted structures, um, which uh, we know will not allow nucleosomes to move around and we believe are refractory to transcription for a lot of reasons. So we want to understand what these compacted structures are. Um, so they're created by PRC1. PRC1 is targeted and PRC1 is the engine of silencing. And they are created primarily by the original class of PRC1 complexes that my laboratory identified in flies and in humans in the late 90s and early 2000s um, that contain these four polycomb group proteins. There is a second class of PRC1 complexes that are very good at ubiquitilation, defined by the Zhang, Verizer, Bardwell, and Vidal group that contain ring 1B and posterior sex combs and homologs and other proteins that are involved in ubiquitilation. So this is actually a large family of complexes that is unfortunately referred to in the literature as if it's monolithic fairly frequently. I'm focusing on these complexes right here. In flies, the protein that compacts is posterior sex combs. So uh, summarizing a huge amount of work, posterior sex combs alone can compact in a complex that can compact and the region that does the compaction is responsible is at the C-terminus and correlates extremely well with the genetics of silencing. So compaction, the ability to compact and the ability to silence in an organism are correlated. Um, problem, the big problem from these data is that when we look for this domain in mammals, the human and mouse homologs of posterior sex combs clearly do not have this domain at all. So if this is important for how repression occurs, what the heck is going on in mammals? So Dan Grau set about to address this question with Nicole and Chris and um, to make uh, a very five years of work in one and a half minutes. He, he found that um, in mammals, it is not the posterior sex combs homolog that does the repression. It is the polycomb homolog. CBX2, CBX6, CBX7, CBX6, 8 in the new nomenclature, M33 in the old nomenclature, uh, proteins that many of you might be familiar with. If you take uh, beads on a string structure, they'll compact, whereas the posterior sex combs homolog will not compact. Dan mapped the compaction domain and found that it's high positive charge and predicted to be disordered and then use that to look in every organism that has polycomb that is widely studied to see if he could find members of the PRC1 complex that would do this compaction. And this is the key slide. This is five years worth of work to get to this. We're able to show that PRC1 components from flies, mouse, worms, frogs, and zebrafish 
are all able to create this uh, uh, same compacted structure. And so we believe this is an evolutionarily conserved function for PRC1. And so that is why we are so keen to figure out what exactly is happening with this compaction. So what we want to do is try to understand compaction and we want to try to understand what the functional output of that compaction is. Other groups are working in this area in vivo. Wendy Bickmore's group has shown that um, Hox loci are uh, repressed independent of ubiquitination via compaction by using microscopy. Steve Hennikoff's group has shown that nucleosome turnover rates, which would be expected to be lowered by these compacted structures, are indeed lowered on, poly on polycomb group sites. So there is uh, data that is consistent with this model. But what it brings up to me is a really important problem in understanding mechanisms, and that is how do we understand the role for location, compaction, and dynamics of nucleosomes. If this is really important to repression, what do we want to be able to do? We would love to know where nucleosomes are. MNA-seq is a mess in large eukaryotes. We've done, uh, spent more money than I care to think about trying to do this. We can get answers, but the bioinformatics is extremely complicated right now, uh, caused by the hundredfold larger genome size. Uh, and so we can't do what all the yeast people can do. Um, and the technologies for assessing compaction by microscopy, or to me more important, the dynamics of how chrome nucleosomes go on and off DNA are extremely difficult. There's very little literature on this. In larger eukaryotes, there's some in yeast. Uh, people like Ollie Rando are doing it. Steve Hennikoff is doing it in larger eukaryotes. But these dynamics, I think, are going to be key and we really need methodologies there. Um, this and covalent modification of nucleosomes, which is the other thing that's involved in, in silencing. Here we have a great technology. We've got thousands and thousands of papers using chromatin immunoprecipitation. We know where covalent modifications occur all over the genome. So this we understand, this part we don't. This is where we need to get technology. Uh, and I will say that despite the fact we know where all these things are, the ability to assess what these modifications are doing is currently limited. So I'm going to finish by talking about structural work we're doing to try to address these problems and show you a crystal structure of what uh, we believe blobs, well, a crystal structure of a silencing protein that creates blobs. And this addresses both two of these aspects that I was just talking about. It addresses the location, compaction, dynamics of nucleosomes, and that it addresses how a regulatory protein can form a compacted structure. It addresses covalent modification of nucleosomes because it uh, tells us how acetylation of H4K16 uh, impacts at, at a molecular level. So this is work done by my crystallography group in the lab. Prem Jean Armash is the head of the crystallography group right now. Very talented postdoctoral fellow, Joe Garlick lab manager does all the protein purification with Kareem Jean, Jesse Cochran, and Ji Jun have since left the laboratory. Uh, Thomas Schwartz's group is essential for this, and Song Tan and Carolyn Luger were essential for setting this up. So this is um, a, a case where we want to take this and we want to figure out what PRC1 does. We want to crystallize these blobs and get a crystal structure here. So just like I said before, here we set up everything to crystallize PRC1. And while we were doing that, we also looked at other proteins that created blobs, such as the SIR protein in yeast. Shown here, this creates blobs uh, that silence in yeast, as shown by Danish Moazed. And once again, while going after polycomb, we got something else. We got SIR3. I think we should try to go after something else, because then we might get polycomb. But um, so what I'm going to show you is actually not polycomb, but it is uh, uh, a compacted structure that looks similar in the microscope, and it is a compacted structure that's involved in silencing, and it's involved in the key developmental decision that yeast make, which is uh, s regulation of mating type. And so you've got to silence the mating type loci to do regulation of mating type, classic paradigm for gene silencing. SIR3 protein is involved in silencing. Uh, SIR2 is critical in that it deacetylates H4 lysine 16, and I'll explain why that is important in a moment. And um, 
So this is a beautiful model system for understanding silencing in yeast. And again, this does the same thing. Here's the beads on a string structure. This is work from Jeff Hansen's group. And SIR3 protein alone will create <coughs> these compacted structures in a microscope. So SIR3 protein can create compacted structures. 220 amino acid and terminus is all that is needed for silencing both in vivo and in creating compacted structures in vitro from these works. And it has been crystallized without being on a nucleosome. So we have a small crystallizable domain that is able to create a compacted structure. What does it do when you put it on a nucleosome? So uh, we took nucleosome coparticles, you mix them with the silencing protein, and we were able to get a very well-defined peak, set drops, get crystals, and solve the structure. So this is the structure, three-point angstrom crystal structure of a silencing protein bound to a nucleosome. This is the silencing protein in orange. The histones in the center of the nucleosome are in blue. The DNA wrapping around is in white. The first key point I want to make is that the silencing protein is talking to the histones. It has a huge interface uh, with the histones, and I'll show you more, more detail in a second. It is, has very few contacts at all with the DNA. So it's a protein-protein interface that is at the center of this silencing machine. Where are the contacts? They're in the H4 tail. This relates to covalent modification, which I'm about to get to. And they are in the center, which also relates to covalent modification. I'm not going to talk about the acidic patch. What are the key features? The key features are that there's a beautiful correlation between genetic and physical contact. So here is the um, crystal structure. Now we're going to open it up like a book, and we're going to ask where are the physical interfaces between the histones and the silencing protein. And this is a huge physical interface between the histones and the silencing protein shown in red here. There is 30 years of genetics on this protein, and here are where all of the genetic interfaces are between the histones and the silencing proteins, and that is the overlap. So we have an atomic explanation for over 30 genetically identified mutations. About 50% of everything that's been identified is impacting silencing in yeast. So we are convinced that this is a biologically relevant silencing structure. How does this structure form? So we have a lot of help here because the nucleosome core particles have been crystallized by Carolyn Luger and Tim Richman. The AH domain was crystallized here by Ruming Zhu when he was here with Rolf Sternglantz. And so we could look at how our structure differed from those two. And the cool thing that happened was that both the nucleosome and the silencing protein have altered conformation when they form a complex. Everything in red here, this histone tail, and these bits of the BAH domain have all either become ordered or altered in conformation when this complex is formed. So you can see that in the space filling model. Here is the H4 tail right here. That is the Luger structure. Here is our structure. And so you can see that H4 tail is going back and forth. So this is the H4 tail uh, with our structure. And that is exactly where the silencing protein docks, right on top of that knob on the H4 tail. You look at it in detail, here's the luger richman H4 tail. In the structure we have, the H4 tail is ordered farther out and has a different conformation than it did in the luger richman structure. So this is a key conformational change, and this relates to how histone modification impacts silencing. What happens to the silencing protein itself? Here is the Rolf Sternglanz Ruming Zhu APO structure, not bound to the nucleosome. When it's bound to the nucleosome, everything in red has changed conformation or become ordered. There are huge structural changes in the silencing protein when it hits the nucleosome. And so there are structural rearrangements in both the nucleosome core particle and the silencing protein BAH upon complex formation. And I think that's going to be fundamentally important in thinking about how these compacted structures form. 
what does it tell us about covalent modification of histones? Uh, we get a lot of insight into the role, of particularly of H4K16, and some into the role of methylation of H3K79. Here are the two residues that are covalently modified on this silencing, on the nucleosomes that impact silencing. H4K16 is here, H3K79 is here. They're very close to each other on the surface of the BAH domain. I'm going to start by looking at H4K16. The end terminus, why do we care about H4K16? The end terminus of histone H4 is critical for silencing in yeast. Um, deletions and mutations of this end terminus relieve silencing. This is the original work from Mike Grunstein's classic work that indicated that histones were critical in gene regulation. H4K16 acetylation blocks silencing and prevents SIR3 from binding to chromatin. H4K16 acetylation was the very first application of chromatin immunoprecipitation to, his, uh, to histones by Jim Broach and by Dave Ellis and Miriam Bronstein uh, 20 years, 25 years ago now. No, less than that, a while ago. Um, Okay, so H4K16 regulates silencing. If you're acetylated, you're not silenced. If you're not acetylated, you are silenced. That's why SIR2 has to get rid of the acetylation. Here is where the tail is going. This is H4K16. Here is the BAH domain, the silencing protein. H4K16 sits in this incredibly negatively charged pocket on the surface of the silencing protein. This is a web of molecular interactions that create a huge amount of energy in creating this pocket. If you acetylate this residue, you blow up all of these interactions here, and you blow up the ability of this pocket to form and this part of the silencing protein to interact with the nucleosome. So uh, the molecular, what acetylation is actually doing here is functioning as an anti-repressor. It is dis going to disrupt the key physical interactions that hold the repressor in place. See something similar if we look at the core surface of the nucleosome. Here's a silencing protein talking to histones H2A, H2, uh, H3, H4, and H2B. H3 is in blue, H4 is in green, H2B is in pink. This is the silencing protein in orange. Every single amino acid whose structure is drawn, which is a lot of them, is forming a key contact. There's a huge interface of interactions here. One of the key areas of that interaction is between H3, K79. Methylation of this impacts silencing, although exactly how is controversial, and that is uh, contact in the BAH domain with these two amino acids on the BAH domain. If you methylate this residue, you're going to alter the energetics of these interactions pretty clearly. So once again, the covalent modification is acting to alter and likely impair the ability of the silencing protein to bind. Okay, so I'm going to show, uh, finish now simply by showing um, what we, one possible model for what this blob actually looks like. This is what we believe was SIR3 and the nucleosome, the compacted structure might actually look like at the crystal structure level. This is the unit cell of the crystal. It's a 611 unit cell, axis going that way. And uh, this is crystal packing. This can be an artifact, but it's kind of fun to look at because it looks like an Oreo sandwich where the nucleosome is the cookie and the silencing protein is the cream, sort of stacked on top of each other and you're getting this sort of helical structure. Down here is it rotating around, and I've color-coded the BAH domain to show that it's a BAH dimer that's holding the two pieces of nucleosomes together. Orange is one half of the dimer, red is the other half of the dimer. They're interacting with the nucleosomes to create this sandwich-like structure. Uh, Rolf Sternglantz at Ruming Zoo's lab had shown that this dimer also occurs in the APO structure previously. And so we believe that this structure is uh, a plausible structure for being at the center of this compacted structure. Um, so to summarize, 
the way the silencing protein works is you have a large interaction interface between the silencing protein and the nucleosome. It's biologically relevant because of the, the tremendous fit between the structure and the genetics. Uh, it is formed, and this w I believe is going to be important when we start finally get a structure of polysome. I think it's likely we'll see something similar to this. There's a lot of induced fit here where the silencing protein is changing conformation when it hits the nucleosome. And it gives us a molecular basis for understanding this particular uh, covalent modification of the histone and what it does. So we believe that what we've learned is that silencing proteins can form a large interface with nucleosomal histones that can bridge histones. And that one thing covalent modification of histones can do in this particular instance is disrupt a key binding site. So this gets away from the reading, writing, repressor, activator, uh, you know, activating mark. This is actually an anti-repressing mark in that it blows up the interface. And so I'll finish there by acknowledging Kareem Jean Armash, an incredibly talented crystallographer who spent several years developing that beautiful structure. Joe Garlick, who uh, worked with Kareem Jean and did all the protein purification on that right here. Uh, Dan Grau did all of the EM work on um, polycomb and uh, the Schwartz group at MIT was essential for uh, doing our crystal work and we had a huge amount of help from Carolyn Luger who graciously helped us learn how to make nucleosomes that could crystallize Song Tan uh, and Rolf Sternglant. Thank you. Bob, over here, on your left. Yeah. So the, the issue that you had uh, about MNAs in the mammalian system, about why it was a problem, maybe it's uh, not so much the technology as it is that organisms may not really care where nucleosomes are placed except in the vicinity of functional elements. Yes. And since they're so rare, relatively rare in mammals, yeah. that's why it's an issue. Right, and that's exactly the, uh, I'm glad you raised that, Frank, because that's exactly where I was going in my comments with Kevin this morning. <laughs> and that is that uh, the vast majority of nucleosome in mammals is w what is, is fuzzy. In other words, you don't see much. And that creates bioinformatic complexity because when your bioinformaticians try to sort out the places where different regions are different from each other, you end up getting a lot of stuff back that's nowhere, that's just fuzziness is different from other fuzziness and you don't care about. Whereas if you go by eye, you can see regions that are different. But nobody wants to look at where nucleosomes are by eye throughout the entirety of a mammalian genome. They'd like shoot their advisor and given that I'm their advisor, I really don't want to go there. But um, so it's a huge, huge bioinformatic problem. Well, and we're working very hard with Peter Park's group on solving yeah, I just right say, say, why don't you just filter out all of that uh, by just looking at uh, regions around functional elements or transcriptional start sites? Yeah, well, we could do that, but, but what we actually, what I believe is we're going to find new functional elements by looking at where the nucleosomes are. So I think we're losing yeah, a lot of the information we want. We could, we can see what we think we should see at promoter regions, right? So we've rediscovered nucleosome-free regions at transcription start sites about 10 or 15 times over right now. Um, but, you know, uh, we really want to see changes in some place that we didn't think there would be any changes at all. So that's where we're stuck. Yeah. Uh, right here. Hi. So great, wonderful work. I have two questions, one for each part. On the first part, uh, about the actual, the, the, the targeting of rocks uh, on the genome. It's, um, I mean, you're finding this motif, which is great. My question is, do you have additional insights as to what the mechanism of targeting is? You basically propose right. several mechanisms, this invasion, the sort of yeah. structure and so on. Who's driving the specificity? Is it the RNA? Is it the complex? Yeah, and that's a great question. And um, I don't think that the RNA is driving the specificity. But if the RNA isn't driving the specificity, why do you need the RNA there? Is it just a relic of evolution that the RNA is there and holding things together in such a way that you get the specificity? It makes no sense to me that the specificity is going to be driven by standard Watson Crick interactions. And there's no evidence that I'm aware of that that is actually what happens. So I think what we need is a lot more examples of this. And then again, 
this is exactly where you guys can come into the equation. If somebody can start looking at these and looking for patterns, then we might be able to get some really solid hypotheses for why the RNA is helping to drive things from certain places. Does the, does the protein itself have a DNA binding domain, or could the RNA itself be folding and hugging the, the DNA without? Well, well, the MSL complex, there's definitely DNA binding domains in the MSL complex. Um, polycomb components can definitely bind to DNA, are they, but they don't bind with any sequence specificity. Does the RNA somehow combine with that yeah. to create sequence specificity with a protein? Is there an allosteric chain? All yeah. that sort of thing. Fascinating question. Yeah. Uh, my, my second question is, uh, you have this amazing, uh, uh, I, I can stop there if you want. <laughs> 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 this amazing interface <laughs> that basically spans just so many atoms. The evolutionary constraints on that must be just incredibly tight. My question is, are these proteins extremely well preserved now across evolution? Is the same interface, do you believe, uh, just fixed? And the crystal structure was SIR3. Yes. The depressing thing about SIR3 from our standpoint is SIR3 is not conserved across evolution as a silencing protein. What it is in humans and what is very interesting is it is ORC1, the BAH domain. The, the human, in yeast you have SIR3 and ORC1. Uh, Laura Roche has shown that or the ORC family bifurcated into ORC1 and SIR3. All that's left in mammals is ORC1, but that's the origin recognition complex. And the BAH domain of the or ORC1 in humans, mutations in that actually cause a human disease syndrome, Meyer Gorland syndrome. And so we're in the process, and we have crystals of human ORC1 bound to the nucleosome. But we don't believe that that's actually silencing that we're looking at that's going to be involved in uh, replication regulation, but it's still an interesting and important question. But we think that polycomb is going to be a different story. As, as a side story, the SIR, SIR3 is the faster evolving post whole genome duplication. Basically, they, they duplicated actually at the whole genome duplication event, mm -hmm. and ORC1 is the ancestral form, so I'm not surprised about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking I might be a glass half, half full kind of person because when I saw your 50% of genetics and structure overlap, <laughs> I was wondering about the other 50% that right. didn't. <laughs> yeah, so 50% is good because we only have 220 amino acids of a very large SIR3 protein, okay? So um, there are a whole lot of mutations that impact silencing in yeast that are in the rest of the very large SIR3 protein. And um, there's a very interesting structure that forms in the C-terminus that Aaron, 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 Aaron Hopper Murray has recently solved, uh, which also has potential nucleosome interactions. So what we believe we're looking at is a central part of the repressive component, but nowhere near the whole story. And you notice we had no linker DNA, and we have no idea whether the silencing bridges different sets of nucleosomes. So we've got a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for where the rest of those mutations can be having impact. Yes, Kevin. So um, the two, the SIR3 and the polycomb complex in the EM look kind of similar as blobs, but mm -hmm. it's just wondering your, your comment as far as I know, uh, at least what Mike was showing, Levine was showing yesterday, was suggestive evidence, pretty good evidence, that there was a block in initiation that polycomb was doing. Right. Uh, whereas the yeast work, although it's not absolutely convincing, it's pretty likely that it's probably not affecting initiation, certainly not affecting the binding of transcription factors, right. and it's probably affecting elongation. I'm sort yeah. of wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts. So, so two thoughts. The first is that those compacted structures could be Actually, they're not the same, but they, they could easily be impacting either elongation or initiation depending upon precisely where the compacted structures are actually forming. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think we also, when in the, in the things that we can see out of our MNA seq we see uh, polycomb regulated genes have a nucleosome over them when they're repressed when you differentiate an ES cell down differentiated lineages. So uh, I, I think it's, it's very plausible and I like the idea that what polycomb is doing is holding a nucleosome in place on top of the start site and blocking the polymerase from getting in. But it could also be sitting farther down in the gene and blocking things there and when the polymerase and, and blocking elongation and Anapombo and, and, other, and um, other groups have evidence that there might be an elongation block. And I, I don't see any reason why it has to be one or the other. I think it's perfectly fine 
the yeah. different genes, different, different things will happen. Uh, and a uh, related thing is, have you or anybody else ever done an experiment where you sort of do a GAL4 fusion to the compaction domain to see, even in polycomb, since you'd think a lot of that compaction would mm -hmm. be uh, happening in yeast if it's the histones, after all. Um, so what if you were to do that, either in yeast or in mammalian cells, y has anybody done an experiment like that and looked to see whether it's blocking you know, either of those processes? Right, and so we actually, that was the very first experiment we ever did in 1993. We fused uh, polychrome itself to a DNA bind GAL4 and looked in mammals and it blocked transcription and then we decided to actually try to go after the real complex and we've never returned to that system. And Vince Parada has done that and shows a block through elongation on the HSP7 as the motor in fly. But I was talking about just the compaction domain alone because you didn't, that was not, you know, you think you know at least yeah. one of the major components and the other, other part of it may just all be there for recruiting the whole thing. It may be that's the real business end of it. Yeah, we haven't done that because we didn't know where it was. Oh, oh you're right, you didn't do a sample. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so Bob, that was really beautiful. I have a question about the, uh, 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 the crystal packing of the SIR3. So it looks like the free ends or the, the entry and exit of the DNA uh, from the nucleosome as in the crystal packing uh, don't align well enough for adjacent nucleosomes to form in the fiber. So d would you care to speculate at all about the higher order packing uh, that uh, the structure would impose? Yeah, we think the DNA is going off like that and that what we're seeing is that without this, okay? So that's the model that fits with everything, and we're actually trying to crystallize actually this with it to see whether that actually obtains. 